Okay, welcome. Friday afternoon. I, I'm, I'm delighted to see many of you here. I know that uh, Friday, af Friday afternoon in Leiden, usually we have what's called a Holland Borrel. You know, the group gets together and we have some drinks and, and, and whatever, and some table chips and peanuts. And, uh, uh, and that's usually happening at 5. So if we would have a lecture there from 4 to 6, there would be very few students, and I'm very impressed. <laughs> okay, so today we'll uh, talk about detectors. So everything you put at the end of your instrument or in the focal plane of the telescope to record an image or a spectrum. And that's very important because uh, a lot of that also, uh, the way you work also determines in many cases how you, how you operate the whole thing. Also, how you design observations. Right? Like for example, if you, if you make a wide field survey, you can imagine that you don't just look in one direction, but you, you cover the sky with many exposures, and then how you combine them, this depends on how you detect the But, before I get there, we have a couple of things from last time that we haven't finished. These are the last. Uh, okay. So before we start with detectors, there were a couple of things. Uh, two students actually asked me how this works. And so if you have signal to noise is proportional to the square root integration time it increases, and it's proportional to d squared, like pulse of diameter, then all you can combine the two. And then you set the integration time to be proportional to the fourth uh, power of the telescope and not to the minus fourth power. And then it makes no sense. And my point is, it's simply, it's a bit too simple to combine that. These are sort of, it's not an equation, it's a, it's a very quantitative description. Because you could also turn this around and say, well, okay, let's, let's just square it. And then the integration time is proportional to this signal to noise squared. So that means if I integrate twice as long, I get, I get four times the signal to noise. And that's, of course, not true. So I'm, I'm just saying, the, the simple uh, uh, jump from here and here to here is not true. In fact, it's a bit more complicated, and, and in order to figure that out, we would have to look at the more complicated equations that we didn't do. So don't worry. But just believe me, I hope you believe me, uh, this came in law that if your telescope is, is uh, uh, two times bigger in diameter than the time it takes. Uh, to, to get the same detection of a source is just then uh, 2 to the 4 times smaller. It would just change this work or...? No, 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 no. It, is, it is just the way it's written here. It's, it, it's, it's, it's the definition and the, the formula is different. So it, it's what you... Okay, it depends on what you say. Well, for the same signal to noise or if you say it scales and Okay. It, it would require more words than that uh -huh. to make it simple. Perhaps you pointed out that D squared is the area, so the integration time is proportional to the area squared. D squared is the area, yes. So it comes in the D squared. The area is squared. Correct. The other thing is that I, I didn't answer correctly, or no, last, uh, yesterday, was that I checked this and of course, the, when we talk about the central obscuration, we talk about the diameter of the area. So epsilon here. Epsilon square, of course, is the sort of the, the area. Epsilon is this place. Okay. So this was just. And this is where we stopped about the color scope. Yes. And uh, there were a couple, we said, if there were no, no further technical development, the way that the color scopes were built last century, it would have end of the 19th, early 20th century, the telescope development of has stopped there. The Derby's Observatory as well this gigantic refractor. That's about one meter in size, and that's about the largest lens you can easily make. You can make. Okay? But you can't just polish glass lenses of, of, of uh, uh, you know, larger diameters and align them properly because they have all kinds of problems that the thermal and, uh, so there are size limitations that we said we needed to get the telescope smaller. In fact, the uh, Palomar, the 5 meter Palomar Observatory, has already about the, the weight of the Statue of Liberty 
in New York. And so if you can get to a, to a whatever 10 meter telescope and the first weight doesn't scale linearly, then you would have gigantic uh, observatories. So you need there's a couple of important innovations that can be made. And one thing, for example, one uh, innovation is that for larger telescopes, you cut the pupil into smaller segments. And then you just have to uh, just that's a tricky issue of course. But you have to make sure that the segments are very well aligned. Aligned? I mean, the relative alignment of those in the surface, of course, has to be much less, much better than one wavelength. So if you have this, this uh, working in visible wavelengths, say 500 nanometers, that means that the relative alignment of those also have to be much better than 500 nanometers. Or you will get a very fuzzy image. So the reason to have segmented mirrors is, is the production becomes easier because people have to work only on say a one meter segment for the Keck telescope, for example, these are about a meter in diameter pack or size. The transport gets a lot easier because you can imagine that when the polymer telescope, the five meter telescope in California, when they transported it in the, in the 30s or 40s of the last century, uh, that was a, a huge operation to transport from, from upstate New York all across the United States to five meter mirrors. They had to close off roads and, and, and find uh, places where, where the truck would pass by. The, the kids were at, at a free day in school because they were at home to, to watch. There is a book written about this, which I highly recommend. They're really entertaining. But you can't do this with an eight or a ten meter mirror. Right? You would not fit through a, through a bridge or something like that. So, segmenting mirrors is the only solution for very large telescopes. And it also helps by polishing them, because we said before, in order to want to make the dome small, we want a fast mirror. Fast means it has to be very curved. And of course, it's easier to, ma to manufacture a strongly curved small segments than a big mirror. But then the other problem is, I think this is something uh, which is not obvious. I mean, if I take, okay, if I take this sheet and I support it here somewhere, and what you can see, of course, is that it's flexing, right? So, what do I do that it's not flex? Hmm? Oh yeah, that's that's another. Yeah, but still, I mean, it's it's still flexing. Then it's in between, unless yeah. Unless I support it really everywhere, then I just have a, a, have a bigger mirror. I mean, yeah, I can make it bigger. Right? Can I take your book? Okay. If you can me, this is not flexing. Right? Okay. okay, thank you. But, uh, there is a limit. There is a limit because at some point the mirror becomes so heavy by its own weight that it flexes under its own weight. So it, it, it just says you can put it somewhere, but then you move it on the sky. Right? So the gravity changes. So the mirror, you look in a different direction. And because it's so heavy by itself, if you make it thicker, it, it becomes stiffer, but it becomes also heavier. And so, so you're, you're lost. You cannot build a very thick, stable, not flexing mirror. Okay. And so, if it, if it flexes anyway, the idea here that was first uh, looked at by this uh, NTT telescope, the idea was to make the mirror really thin. So this is 8 meters across, and the mirror is just about that thick, which is relatively thin for a 8 meter size. And what you then do is, you put actuators at the bottom, and some motors there, and this is what's called active optics. Please don't confuse it with adaptive optics. We'll get to adaptive optics later, next week. So completely different. Okay. This is called active optics, and it just means active means something is happening. And what's happening is that you measure the image of a star, you analyze the image, and from the way the image looks like, 
you know, oh, my mirror is a bit out of shape. I need to push it here a bit, and it gets in shape again. And then you send a command to the motor and say, hey, push it up here. Okay, and your mirror is, is, is flat, not, not flat, but in shape, in the normal shape. Okay? And of course, this flexible, sort of semi-flexible the mirror first changes the shape whenever you look at the different location on the sky, the different scene and things. So you have to make you have to update this control all the time. But with a computer, no problem. You just have to do the whole thing. You have to have a good model. And then you, uh, yeah. you have motorized control there, and that takes care of it. But if I do some calibrating, should that work? It's just it's in a mirror. You mean how to know when it's out of shape? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I will get back to that when we talk about adaptive options, because then we have to do it all the time. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think if you, if you can be patient until next week, then, then we'll discuss all that when we How long does it take to go to the uh, This is, uh, well, you do it before the, the, the night, so this is, this is a very slow loop. This is not like an adaptive optics where you have to do this in milliseconds. Because it doesn't change quickly, right? It's just the gravity that changes a bit. And when this is continuously done, all you need to do is the, the, the telescope needs to have a star somewhere in the wider field. But how long does it take to and uh, I think in order to complete the process, it's about 20 seconds or so, but uh, it is continuously done during the observations. Okay. So just to show you what you can do, I mean, so let's compare Palomar is a classical telescope in the, in the old traditional way. And the PET telescope is a modern segmented telescope. And if you just compare some of the, the numbers here, Telescope aperture, so there's only a factor of two in between. So that means twice as large in diameter, mm. or four times in area, probably. But the mass of the telescope itself drops from 600 tons to polymer to 300 tons. Because you go to a very compact uh, alt altitude passing route mount. So you save a lot of mass for the for the telescope mount there. Well, this is a monolithic mirror. This has actually 36 of these hexagonal segments. The segment size there is 1.8 meters versus 5. And, and the mass here is 400. But if you, if you multiply the 400 uh, with, with 36. Uh, okay, and just, just for comparison here, this is the, the space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. So we launched in 2018, which has an aperture that's not that different. But of course, launching something is very expensive. So you make everything extremely light. Right? You don't use steel, you may use beryllium or, or silicon carbide or materials like that. And you can see that, well, the mass per segment, the segment, this is in the background actually, you see some optical engineers here of NASA. Uh, and you see some of the, the, the mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope here. And each of the mirrors here, of those mirrors, for the Keck Telescope, they weigh about 400 kilograms. But the ones that are launched to space, first they have to have at least the same requirements in terms of optical quality. They're only 20 kilograms. Easily there. So this is, and, and of course, this is, uh, all these techniques are very, very challenging. And uh, most, most of these production methods and, and control efforts only become possible with fast computers. Okay, now we've been talking about optical telescope all along, and I should mention, of course, that then at least two other types in the radio and X ray telescopes. For radio telescopes, it's relatively simple because they follow a similar principle as optical telescopes. You have a primary dish here, a radio telescope, radio astronomers call it a dish rather than, than the primary mirror. And then you have a, a secondary mirror, 
selector here, and then uh, some receiver here. We call the receiver because we call the radio wave, which is right here, like the radio. Um, and I mean, one of the obvious differences here is that uh, you don't have a dome around. You wouldn't build an optical telescope without a dome because your telescope mirror has to be really shiny. It gets a bit of dirt. Forget it. If, if someone scratches it, it's a problem. Right? So your telescope, I mean, if, if for, for example, if you have, uh, uh, for example, La Palma, for example, uh, Canary Islands, it sometimes gets sandstorms from Africa. And of course you know this in advance, but then you better close your dome fairly quickly. Because if the sandstorm goes across your polished mirror surface, then your mirror is ruined. Right? It's like sandpaper. So you want a really shiny mirror. And that's because you really have to be, the surface has to be flatter or more homogeneous than the wavelengths. Again. If you want high surface quality, high reflectivity of your mirror, and you want an optical mirror that works at 500 nanometers, so half a micron wavelength, then your mirror has to be better polished. All the, the, certain, the, the roughness has to be gone, and all these structures, much less than this, this half a micrometer, can be left. If you go to radio wavelengths, if you observe at whatever, 10 centimeters, the same applies, but that means that your mirror only has to be, uh, to be smooth or you know, uh, smooth to better than, much better than 10 centimeters. Uh, 10 centimeters, you can even go there and scratch the surface, it doesn't matter. Okay? And that's why you don't need uh, uh, to put a dome around. So you can just leave it open while it rains. Problem rise again. Okay. And of course there are many, I'll just show you, but maybe we can turn off the light for those few images. So this is just to give you an idea of some of the telescopes. Uh, this is the Parks uh, 64 meter telescope. It's in Australia. It's the bank, Jogger Bank telescope uh, in the UK. The Affelsberg telescope uh, in Germany I couldn't resist to show it's not, not uh, operating anymore. It's being used actually by amateur astronomers now in the Netherlands in, in, in the low. Um, there, this used to be the Green Bank telescope, so I find this uh, picture quite uh, interesting here. So that it collapsed overnight. The structure, structural problems, it was operating fine for, for many years and then sometimes at night no one was hurt fortunately the whole telescope gone right and they have now rebuilt it it's now I think the biggest single dish telescope again but those are all steerable meaning you can steer the telescope you tell the telescope where to go and the primary mirror will move this one is not this is the famous it's the biggest telescope actually of all famous Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. And as you can see, it's a nice landscape here with lots of small uh, hills and, and uh, those, those dips here. And so they put a, simply a concrete surface there. And it's a spherical shape. And so what they do is actually the pointing. I mean, the spherical shape would, of course, point always to see that that's not where you want to look necessarily. But the pointing is then done with the secondary mirror. So depending on, on where you uh, move that mirror, that's where you where you look at. Right? And can you turn on the light, please? If, uh, so let's just, I mean, if you have a, 
they will just enter the material. But if you have a very small angle of incidence, they will be reflected. If that angle is small, let's just look at it again. And the but So the principle is obvious for just one surface, right? The, the, the rays come in and, and are reflected here. But then you put all, you reflect all rays on one spot, you would never be able to produce an image. But if you want to preserve the spatial information, if you want an image, you need many of those shells, many of these, these only layers, and then you get some, some uh, image. Not only the the, oh, I don't have that here. For, I don't know the number, but there are plenty, like hundreds. Different types of 
Fundamentally speaking, there are three types of detectors here. And most of today, we'll talk about photon detectors. The photon detectors are defined as, as some device that responds directly to individual photons. So something, some physical process happens here, uh, some quantum mechanical process, I should say, happens here. Uh, and we'll see what does Namely, the photoconductors, CCDs are one example, photodiodes, and so on. But there's a second type, namely the thermal detectors, which absorb photons, but it's more a, a thermal, uh, thermal dynamic process, not a quantum mechanical one. And uh, those are used for longer wavelengths, typically called photometers. And there's a third type, and since we don't have enough time, Unfortunately, I have no, uh, I cannot go into the details here, or I will not tell you about them at all. But uh, they're called the coherent receivers, which record essentially not just the intensity of the photon, but also the phase. So in other words, they record the electromagnetic field, and uh, they're also called heterodyne receivers. Now, these are the typical radio receivers. Okay, but for most of today, we'll talk about the photon detectors. And in order to understand how they work, I think I should give you a very, very brief introduction to solid state. <laughs> and if it's just a reminder. So I presume you all know what this is, right? But the main, the main point here is that, of course, it's, it's sorted uh, in a way that the, 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 the column here represents the number of electrons in the outer shell. In the case here, if, uh, of, of uh, the fourth column of the periodic table here, you have always four electrons in the outer uh, uh, shell of the shell. And because of that, these elements with the four electrons pointed out again, so carbon, silicon, uh, germanium, I think that's, those are the most important ones, uh, they form a crystal lattice. Okay? And the crystal lattice, or the specific crystal lattice, may be a diamond lattice. So that means that each atom is bound to four neighbors. So you have, for example, a silicon. Silicon knows of doing some lattice diamond lattice. So each silicon has uh, four neighbors and uh, it's connected by uh, two uh, bonds here so that you have essentially each electron is happy because it has uh, eight balanced electrons uh, and so it fills up the, the optimal uh, number of uh, electrons. I'm, I'm assuming that you have heard this in one way or the other before. Uh, so not only diamond, uh, the, 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 no, the diamond lattice uh, may not only be formed by these elements here, carbon, silicon, germanium here, but also by a combination of elements from the third and the fifth column of periodic table. So if you don't have a, if you don't have just silicon, but you can also make a silicon. Of a diamond crystal by having a structure from aluminum and phosphor. So that you have aluminum phosphide, or gallium arsenic, or indium antimony. Okay, so if you mix those elements by equal numbers, they may also provide you with a crystal that is like that. Okay, so this is how we build up our, our uh, photoconductor. There's a very limited number of different materials. And what will happen then, which is very different from, of course, atomic physics, I was wondering how to show that, explain that, and then I found a, a, uh, an animation on Wikipedia, which I thought illustrates qualitatively at least what's happening here. So we'll just see what describes here what's happening. So in quantum physics, an atom in a box displays continuous, that discontinuous energy levels. When a number of atoms is increased, more levels appear until an energy band 
So as soon as now the wave functions overlap here of the atoms, so they, in a matter the atoms share some of their electrons, the energy still depend from the bottom. These electrons can move easily. This allows the metal to conduct electricity well. But when the energy band is completely filled, the electrons become very difficult to move. The material no longer conducts electric current. And then you have an insulator. That's, we just restart that again. which is then usually an increased dark current. 
Okay, so how does uh, the basic principle of a, of a photon conductor, how that we know is, we have a photon, here this is your, your, your pixel or your detector, you have a photon coming from the telescope that hits in the photon plane, the material, this is just a box here uh, that is made of silicon or uh, gallium arsenic or some indium phosphide, something like that. And so you have your diamond lattice here, and usually you have, without energy input, you have uh, those uh, bonds here to the neighbors. But now we have a photon here, it hits here uh, the crystal, and it produces an electron. And where the electron is, it also the, when it the frees, it frees the electron, so because that now has the energy to move away. Right? It's got the energy to move away from here, from this photon. And because it moves away, there is also one missing, that's indicated in blue here, that's the hole. It's essentially meaning a photon and an electron is missing. And of course, what's important here is the quantum efficiency, meaning simply the ratio of absorbed photons over the incoming photons. Absorbed meaning reducing an electron hole there. And uh, the quantum efficiency, remember for photographic plates, we said, uh, before it's very low, it's only 2 or 5 percent. For modern detectors, the quantum efficiency is typically 60, 70, 80 percent. So that means that most of the photons that, that you get from the source, from your astronomical object, are actually converted into something like an electron hole here in the crystal. And if you now apply the voltage, so in this the picture here, you put a voltage here and here, you ground it here, and have some, some positive voltage here, so you have an electric field, and the electric field then pulls the electron to the readout, and if you have an amplifier here, then you can read all how I detected an electric current, and that means I detected light. Okay, so that's the basic principle. There is a limitation, of course, to that, and that's given by what's called the band scale. You remember what we said before? In order to make this photon excite an electron, to make it, to, to remove it from the crystal lattice where it's bound to, an, uh, to its, its host atom, to remove it, you need a certain energy of the photon. Right? Photon energy is H nu, use the frequency and H is the. Uh, Planck's quantum. And then this energy of the photon, of course, has to be larger than its band scale, than the energy that's needed to, to lift it into this uh, freely uh, floating uh, uh, conduction band. And this band scale, this is a material property. It's very different for germanium than for silicon or for indium antimony. But you can, of course, if you solve here, if you say, well, the band gap here has to be, uh, the photon energy H nu has to be larger than the band gap, uh, you can, of course, solve for, for the frequency or for the wavelength. And so you have a wavelength here that's simply Hc, C is the speed of light, over this band gap. And if you don't want to do the calculations now uh, yourself, I'm just providing the numbers, it's 1.24 micrometers. Uh, divided by the band gap in, in electron And if we look at some, some uh, typical materials here, that we said can be used for detective germanium, silicon, garden, arsenic, this is the wavelength cutoff. And the wavelength cutoff, this is really the cutoff until which your detector is operational. And so if you, for example, if you have a silicon detector, detector made of pure silicon, CCD for example, it will work from, from say the UV down to in wavelengths 1.12 micrometers. If you have a propeller, sorry, if you have a proton with a wavelength corresponding to 1.5 micrometer for example, a longer wavelength proton, According here to, to this, that the photon energy is H times uh, uh, frequency, so it has a, a, a shorter, it has a longer frequency, lower frequency, longer wavelengths. 
the energy is not sufficient anymore to make produce a free electron. And because of that, you will not get a signal. So the detector only works to one point, uh, 12 micrometers. If you use germanium, you can go a bit longer at wavelengths. But uh, for gallium arsenic, very, very famous photodiodes, for example, you can also use that as a detector just to invert the process. Usually, if something produces light, you can also use it to detect light, at least for uh, photoconductors. That's even shorter. And of course, we know that there's a lot of astronomy long words of these wavelengths. So, what are we going to do? This bandgap is the work function. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's not obvious why these numbers are are as, as shown here, right? It is. It's a material property. Uh, I mean, it may, what it say it makes sense that germanium, for example, has a slightly longer wavelength than silicon, because the germanium atom is bigger. It has a higher number of, number of uh, in the periodic table. So it has more protons, it has more electrons, and so the valence electrons are actually further away from the nucleus, and, and even if it's the same number as for silicon, they're, they're less bound to the nucleus, so uh, they're also easier to move away, and so it requires less energy, and so the wavelengths for the cutoff is longer. That's the final gap. Yes. Yes, I did not specify the bank of the electron. This is really the top of the Okay, so what can we do? And one, the solution here, I don't want to go into all the details here, but the solution is we offer the material of the crystal essentially electrons that are less bound. To, their, to the atoms in the crystal. We do that by adding, we take it, uh, or we grow a uh, 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 diamond lattice from silicon, for example, let's just talk about silicon. But every now and then in the crystal, we add atoms that are not silicon, but atoms that have an extra electron. So they have well, four valence electron, like carbon, silicon, germanium, but that may have five or three. And this process is called doping. So you have to add, well, you can you could say impurities because they're a different material. So if you don't have pure silicon anymore, you add those materials, and the advantage or we think, I think mean, it's the easiest way to understand it here. If you think uh, about the silicon, we said the crystal is false because uh, each atom with four valence electrons builds up uh, bonds to four neighbors and has now, because they share the first these, these uh, electrons here in the bonds, now it has eight. Right? Uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So now it's happy. And because it's happy, it doesn't want to give them away easily. Again, just to repeat myself, if, if it would give them too easily away, without external energy, you would have a metal. The electrons would be freely uh, loaded and not bound. But you can't use a metal as a detector because you would not respond to light. If you had, if they are bound very closely to the to the atom, then you have an insulator. There would be no current. If you have an, an, uh, a photoconductor, we said that if we provide some energy, we can remove one of the electrons, and it will con contribute to an electric current. But then we found that. The wavelength cutoff is too short, meaning the photons we really need, the photon energy we need for an electron to get removed is too high. 
So now we get an atom with five valence electrons. And that only needs four to fill this into structure here. Four of the valence electrons are needed actually to do to, to, to the bonding to the neighbors. Right? The structure is given by the first group from the neighbor. Only four are needed, so there is an extra electron. Now this extra electron doesn't completely wander around because it still feels the electromagnetic attraction from the nucleus. But this is much less bound to this atom than, for example, an electron here, because it, it has no, no real function. It's just there. So if because it's less bound, that means that we, we now have a photon hitting the material. The energy that is needed to move that electron away is actually much less. And so, if we dope our material here with impurities, like we, we take a, a let's say we take a silicon, the way to read this table is the following. We take a silicon crystal, we add some arsenic atoms. And then we move the wavelength, remember, here we said for silicon the wavelength, the cutoff is 1.1 micrometer. Just, just between the optical and the near infrared. Relatively short wavelengths. Now we add to our silicon crystal uh, some, some uh, arsenic atoms. And then it moves the wavelength from 1.1 microns, the color, to 23 microns. And suddenly we have produced a detector that is also sensitive to infrared light. Okay? And you can move that even to further use germanium and put in phosphor or, or whatever that you can get to, to have more than 100 micrometers away from it. And you don't need many of those. Uh, only every one, let's say, uh, every 100,000 atoms of your silicon lattice has to be replaced by a different species. Okay? It's not worry about the problem. But yes, yes. What it means type in stage. Sorry? Type. Oh, um, it's actually it's very simple. We said you can you can uh, you need to you need to, uh, to add something that does not have four valence electrons to have something to move around. It's easier to understand if you think of an atom with five valence electrons because then you have one extra. And because it's one extra, the whole thing is actually, uh, well, it's, it's, you add essentially an extra negative charge here. But you can also do it if you add an atom that has only three valence electrons. And then you're actually missing an electron, right? So, but the, and energetically the effect is the same. So because there is one missing, that one now suddenly says, hey, give me one. And, and because if there is now a, a photon with a small energy coming in, and, and energy, uh, uh, providing a small energy, because there is already one missing, and so from uh, this atom once more, then there is an, an, an electron moving over there. In the end, current, electric current is always moving electrons, whether you move one because it's missing elsewhere, or because if you move one, it's, if you have one in, in excess, it doesn't matter. Okay, and this P and N simply refers to whether you have an N doped, meaning one excess electron, or T doped, meaning one missing Okay, and then finally, the gears that are so popular, we should have first the physics, then later the operation. A few words on CCDs charge coupled devices. Just to show you how such a device is built. What you see here is just a single pixel. And of course you know, right, you have to you have to buy a new camera or a new smartphone every every uh, half year because at least that's what, what uh, the companies are telling you. Because you, if you're not up to date you don't have the latest 10 megapixel thing. Right? So we know 10 megapixels they're really many many and this is just one of them. But there, this is uh, similar. So you have a structure here, 
Uh, if you look at the base, the silicon, and you, uh, you dope it with P-type silicon, so there is one electron missing in this doping process for uh, impurity. And if you have uh, photons coming in, then the electrons, uh, the poles, you have to, okay, sorry, I should first say, and then you put a, a silicon oxide there, which is an isolator. Well, silicon oxide, or sorry, silicon dioxide is just a, well, like sand. And sand is silicon dioxide. It's an insulator, we know, right? If you, if you, if you can, you can, if you don't believe me, you have to go to the beach and see if, if the sand will conduct the electric current. So you have a, a, an insulator here, and on the other side here you have a metal gate, an electrode, and so you connect to uh, ground the side, and you, you add some uh, voltage on that side, and nominally there would be nothing, because you have no free, free electrons in there, but now if you illuminate it, if you expose your CCD pixel to light, then it will create charges and the electrons or the holes will go this way, the electrons will go this way and you have a region here where the free electrons accumulate and, and because simply because they're and they can't go any further because there is an insulator and they're attracted by the positive voltage here because they're negatively charged so if you then, if you say you take the pixel, you start the exposure, you collect light, you collect more and more electrons, and at some point you have here a lot of electrons, and the number of electrons, of course, is representing the number of photons that were absorbed. Okay, so this is also described the principle. Some semi-bound electrons 
are also shaken off and can move around. This would be called a dark current, meaning that dark current means you get an electric current, although you don't have any light falling on the detector. And this is, of course, not what you want because, I mean, you want to observe real objects, not just a warm lamp. And so, the longer the wavelength, the easier it is to, to, to thermally excite the electrons, and therefore you need to cool them. Okay. Now, uh, now comes the part, I mean, this was sort of, you have to understand how they work. But you're probably not going off now and, and design your own detectors, or build them. Wouldn't have much to do with them right there. There are companies, there are actually only a few companies on this planet who do a really good job in producing high quality detectors. And, and it's very, it's non-trivial. All this has to be done in a, in a clean room, a uh, partial vacuum, and, and uh, it's, it's difficult. But you want to use the detectors, and so you need to understand how they operate, how they work. And there are two fun, there are fundamental differences astronomical detectors between CCDs on one hand and infrared detectors on the other hand. Uh, what's the principal difference between the CCDs and the CMOSD sensor? Um, let me first show you the difference between infrared arrays and CCDs and then the will tell you. Okay? So the mm -hmm. uh, the total charge uh, collected by the sun is yes. The what are the units? Yeah, that's a good point. The, then you separate the detector. You will get no more signal, and you lose information. So that's another reason why you need to know about the the sensitivity of your instrument. Because if you, I mean, yeah, I. I I remember I was I was looking at some star cluster with the, the 3.6 meter telescope on Masia. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought when the DOT became available, I would repeat those observations. But the problem was that even at the shortest exposure time in the, with the detector, something in the order of two seconds, minimum exposure time, a lot of the stars already got saturated with the 8 meter telescope. Meaning there was just too much light on, on in, in these two seconds there, and you have your this was completely full, right? And there were no there were no more electrons to be to be accumulated here. And at that point first it becomes non-linear. Ideally the detector is linear, meaning that if you if you uh, if you look at one source and you get ten thousand uh, electrons, and then you look at the source that's twice as bright you get 20,000 electrons. If you're a non-linear, then this simple linear correlation is not given anymore. And in the most extreme case, it is too bright to separate. And it's not different from, from when you take your, your pocket camera and, and you take a, a snapshot and the sun is in the field, right? And you have this, this blurred spot, but it's not an image of the sun, it's just completely separated. And so the infrared rays, are, there's a lot of detail on that slide, but I, I only want you to get the basic principle. You have here on top, you have a layer, this is your photoconductor material. <coughs> this, this, it's, it's like a sandwich. And the top part of the sandwich here is this, this photosensitive material, this is your, your silicon crystal or your, your doped uh, germanium crystal or whatever. And at the bottom, you have a multiplexer. Which is a it's a complicated circuit. This is only for one pixel, where you can where you can via these these uh, the, the signal lines at the outside of your detector. This is by the way uh, a real detector, which has about thousand by thousand pixels here. It's a super detector. At the bottom you have a layer with lots of, of uh, contact points, and it also includes an electronic circuit that allows you why are these controls here to say, hey, I want to read this part, or I want to read this pixel, or I want to read this pixel. Okay? And the two are, are simply pressed together with some, some 
medium in between to provide the connection. But the main point is that for these kind of array constructions, the circuit that is directly attached to the, to the uh, crystal uh, allows you to access individual pixels. You can read the pixel, you can actually read it a couple of times and see how much charge there is. And that's very nice. Um, let, thank you. let me skip that for now. If we have time in the end, I'll come back. If I don't come back, I'm not going to ask you in the test. But if we have time, I think it's, it's quite useful to talk about this. Let me instead go quickly to the, to the CCD. CCD, charge public device, so charge public out here. The principle here is that well, the, CC, the CCD has no such readout circuit attached to the detector. The CCD is simply the silicon layer, and when you set to read the CCD out, <coughs> same way that the Gaia essentially does it, you transfer in order to get the information, you would have to close the shutter first, and then let's say here we, we have a, a, a we have all the charges. Down here, this is remember this is our insulating silicon dioxide layer. Here are the electrodes, and here we have all the, the charges, the electrons that were accumulated due to the to the exposure with the light. So we have them here, and we want to to transfer them out of the CCD. This is illustrated here. Actually, it's a nice illustration of how it works. So it's a loss of buckets. And it's raining. Yeah, here's the rain, the buckets fill up. But in the in the uh, infrared detector case, you would actually go to the individual bucket and look in there how much there is in there. Water. In the case of the CCD, because it does not have this circuit that allows you to go and look into how much water is in the bucket, you have to have some way to bring the buckets to you. So you're standing here then, and, and it's like they're all on these, these belts here, these conveyor belts, and it's moving all the buckets in this direction first, and then along one line here, and then you read them all one after the other section. And the way this is accomplished here, is that you now we have the, the, uh, all the electrons here because we have a positive voltage here. We apply a positive voltage here and now we move over. And then we set this to ground. And again, so the way if you, if you add the voltage here and you pass the voltage from one pixel to the next one, then the electrons on the other side, on the opposite side of this insulating layer, will follow that. I mean, this is only shown for, for three pixels. But you can imagine this would also work for thousand pixels. And then at the end, you just pass them in the other direction, and yeah, you can read them out. The advantage of that consists of that scheme is that your detector is much simpler. You don't need this electronic circuit that wasn't possible at the time when the CCD was invented. You just need a silicon photo. Uh, sensitive layer and some of these, these uh, electrodes and you have the CCD. And yeah, now coming back to your question about the CMOS. The CMOS is essentially a, a CCD with the same setup but in addition a circuit added that you can address individual pixels. So it's, the CMOS is essentially a, a mixture between the scheme for the infrared arrays and the scheme for the CCDs. The problem, of course, you can imagine here is that you have to pass all these these on. Right? It's, it's like the, the, uh, the games that I played as little kids where, where someone tells a story to someone else who tells a story to someone else and so on, and then you, you listen at the end to what's, what's the, What's the final story? And usually it has changed quite a bit until it comes to 
simply because every time you pass it on, you add something or forget something. And this is simply, this is similar here. It's happening. Go oh, perfect. First it is perfect. You move those charges over to the next uh, position and the next one, and there may be imperfections in the material, and you lose some electrons, some pixels may be dead, and the whole thing doesn't work anymore. And uh, yeah, so the, the performance characteristics that is most important here, and that's of course one of the, the, the most important parts for Gaia, indeed, is the charge transfer efficiency. So meaning what fraction of these electrons will be transferred to the other place. Okay, so now let's look at some some uh, detector noise and artifacts. And this is now directly relevant to observations. And let me just this is very qualitative here, but there are essentially three main components for detection. One is the so-called generation recombination modes. And this is simply uh, given by the photon statistics of the detector, or sorry, of the source. So it's, it's the, the arrival rate of the photon. We said uh, two days ago that this is simply given by the Poisonian statistics of any uh, uh, yeah, so constant source with, uh, in a finite mode. And this statistics is translated then in this process of generating charge carriers. So producing electrons that can uh, uh, travel to the electrodes and uh, report that the photon was absorbed. This is entirely given by nature. There is not much one can do about the generation recombination noise. This, this is simply the photon statistics essentially reflected in the signal. There is another component which is called the constant or KPC noise, and that's a detector property that has to do with the way that pixels are designed. We don't have to understand the details here. But this is given by the technology of the detector, and there is also another component called the one overhead noise, which has many, many different origins. It's actually not, not easy to quantify. All kinds of, of bad things, non-perfect electrical contact, temperature fluctuations, you have maybe damages in the surface layers, defects in the crystal, your output amplifiers or transistors do something weird. And that all together, you can combine all that under the name one over F noise because it, it has essentially a characteristic that the strength of this noise decreases with frequency. Okay. Now, we have one one noise component here which is given by the nature of given by nature. So there's nothing we can do about. It. And we have two components here that are given by our, our uh, detector technology or detector design. So ideally the perfect detector has, does not have these noise components. But of course we can't build a perfect detector. But what we can do is to make sure that these two components are relatively small compared to this uh, generation recombination. I mean, the total noise in the system is simply the square sum of these individual components. But for observations, we want to make sure that this is really the dominating term. In other words, that the, the sum of, of the noise components here that are given by the detector technology and by operation is small compared to the noise component given by nature then we can't do anything about it. Now, what does this mean in practice? Okay. Now, one of our noise is usually relatively small. The KTC noise is also called reset noise because it always happens when you read the detector. So it happens once. You, may, you, take, you take an exposure and then, of course, you want to know how much charges have been accumulated. So you use the readout in the, in the different ways for the CCD or infrared detectors. But in both cases, you have some KTC noise. 
if you take very short exposures, you get this KTC noise and you get some small recombination noise of the source. If you take a very long exposure, you also read it at the end. And your KTC noise is about the same. But then you have a much better signal to noise on the photon statistics of your source. And so the noise you have, uh, this noise becomes very small compared to that one. Right? I mean, let's, let's think about a simple example. Let's say you have a detector that gives you a noise of 10 electrons. Every readout of the detector will just contribute 10 electrons. Okay? And if you look at the source that has whatever, that gives you 16 electrons per second. Some star exposed for one second, you get 16 electrons. Okay. And then, if you're not very smart, you say, okay, I read every second. So what you then have is the photon shock noise on those 16 electrons is how much? What did we say about photon uh, Poisson statistics? Square root. Exactly. So what's the square root of 16? Exactly. So we would have, say, four electrons photon shock noise. And every readout adds 10 electrons of readouts. And then, you know, of course, you want, in order to get a nice image, you add many, many exposures. So say, you add 1,000 exposures. No, let's say 100 exposures. Okay? You add 100 exposures to go order to get a good image of your source. But then you also have 100 times uh, the sweet noise and a hundred times uh, the recombination piece. Okay. Now, now let's say you're smarter. You don't read every second. Now you read every hundred seconds. So now that you're exposed for a hundred seconds, how many counts would you then get? How many electrons from your source? You get 16 in one second, so hundred seconds. 1600. Yeah. Okay, and now what's the what's the noise of 1600? What's the square root of 1600? Sorry. 14. Yeah. Okay. So now we have photon shock noise of 14, and we read the we read the noise and we read the this, uh, the frame only once. So we have 40 electrons noise coming from the source. And we can't do about anything about this, right? This is what nature provides. But at least we can make sure that now we have, compared to the photon shock noise from the source, 40 counts here, our read noise, we said before, is 10. Every read has 10. So we have relatively small read noise. That doesn't really matter. So we can we ignore it. The noise is essentially given on the so you want to make sure when you design an experiment. I mean, the question always is, I have a camera, or how long do I, I mean, you sit at the computer terminal at the observatory, yeah, and there is a field you have to enter, or you have to say exposure time. Now, what number do you enter there? So we know from this requirement, we want to make sure that the noise, the photon shock noise is larger than the real noise. So that means long exposures. But on the other hand, as you said before, if you expose too long, the detector may not work anymore because it's, it's, it has too many uh, electrons and it's getting saturated. So you really need to understand at what level do I become background limited, meaning that it's really the, the so source, the, either from the source, First, that would also apply to the thermal background from the atmosphere. At what point do I become uh, background limited? And at what point do, I, do, do my detector start to saturate? And somewhere in between those two boundaries, this is the exposure time that you 
But this is not first that you, the thing you have to work out. And usually you have to explain the observing strategy when you write a proposal to the observatory. Then you have to say, okay, I'm going to do these observations in the following way. I need integrations for three hours and I want to expose it in, in, in such a way. Yeah? And, and then the, the time allocation committee looks at it and, and says, that makes sense. Okay. And then if you're right, then you may get the observing time. Okay. Now if it were that simple, some detectors are always sad. Uh, there are always uh, problems with detectors. I've just illustrated a few here. Because if you work on detector data, you will it's unavoidable you will see one or the other somewhere. This one was taken uh, from an uh, exposure with the Spitzer Space Telescope Spectrograph. What you see here, these two uh, horizontal lines here, those are astronomical spectra. This is the source of spectrum. However, the other, all these white dots here, these are noisy pixels. And you can imagine this, it's not nice to do the data reduction here, because for example, let's look here, uh, is this now a spectral line, or is this a noisy pixel? Now, how does, how, why are these noisy pixels there? Well, remember, the space telescope means it's in outer space. There are a lot of cosmic rays, and the, the detector is constantly bombarded by, by high-energy protons. And when these high-energy protons see this nice, silicon crystal, right, they, they have a lot of energy. They have the power to destroy this nice crystal, to just make a defect in the crystal lattice. Then it's not our nice diamond lattice anymore, but it's, it's something with a defect. And if you have this defect, that also means that our story with the, the four, uh, the eight valence electrons and, and, and moving, uh, lifting, one in the, in the conduction band, that doesn't uh, apply anymore. You just have a uh, defect uh, of existence. Another thing is that if you expose a bright source, actually this is not so much different from, from, it, from the human eye. You look, well, you shouldn't look at the sun, but if, if you quickly look at the sun and somewhere else, well, you still see an image of the sun. Right? It's not, your, your, the eye is not immediately reset. Same is for the detectors. If you look at the very bright source, usually you don't clear out everything perfectly. In the next exposure, even if the source is not in the field anymore, you would still see some fake source. That's called the latent image. Something that, that stays up there, although there is no source anymore. It usually drops exponentially, fairly quickly, but if you had a really bright source before, then it may take uh, a minute or, or a few minutes actually for it to have disappeared completely from your detector. The detector response is, is usually very, very, uh, can be very. We talked about quantum efficiency before, but not all pixels have the same sensitivity. Some are slightly more sensitive than others. And then no detector is perfectly flat, meaning that if you would illuminate a detector with constant light intensity, some pixels will give you more signal than others, although your source would be completely flat. And so in order to make the detector sort of look flat, you have to apply a method that's called flat looping. See next. And then there are all kinds of other effects, especially in CC. And that means that along the bright source, you have these often these bands, bending structures, or uh, yeah, things that usually have to do with very bright sources. Okay, so this is, this is not a complete list, this is just some, some illustration that uh, in your observations, be prepared that your data are not perfect. So, one important thing you have to do is flat field. As I said before, the detector response varies from pixel to pixel. So an, any image usually has an intrinsic structure that is not due to the image but probably due to the, to the detector response. 
You can, you can com com uh, correct for that by doing some flat viewing. And the way is that you provide an image of, a, well, you illuminate the detector with sort of a, a flat illumination. Some, some source that has no structure. And you can do that either by actually looking with the telescope at, at a wide screen inside the dome. You can use the uh, twilight flats, meaning that in the morning after your observations, when the sky is already getting brighter and brighter, you can take an image, let's say, just, just after sunrise, and then a little bit later, and so the one taken a little bit later is of course brighter, and you subtract the two, and you get a fairly uniform illumination on your detector. You could also use uh, uh, well, sky plans constructing from the observation themselves. In any case, you would you, you take images at two different flux levels of some calibration source. Yeah, that calibration source could be some, someone shining a flashlight in the dome where there is a white screen or uh, using uh, two exposures at, at, at twilight. And then you use the difference between those flux levels. So you just take the difference, F1, F2, those were just some exposures of the sky or of the dome. And they have different light levels. You subtract the two. And then uh, the, the, that's actually the response shows you that uh, the, picture, the image of the detector shows you then how the pixels respond to light. You just have to normalize it then. Uh, normalize it so that, that the average of everything is around unity, so uh, 1.000. And if you then, then uh, you, you, know, you, you invert it, and this is the, the flat field, and all your images that you observe need to be multiplied with that flat field. And then, if you did it right, your astronomical images look at. Okay? Another way to mitigate the problems of non-flat detectors is to dither. And that is simply that because, let's say you don't perfectly flat field, so you still get on the same source from one, the pixel in one corner, you get 5,000 counts, but if you then would put a different pixel there on the same source, you get, you get say, 5,500 counts. But of course you can, and you don't know which one is right. If you make an observation here, and you move your detector around, if you, if you use a larger field anyway, then, then you have to map. And so the idea is there, each box here is one exposure. And you have several boxes here, A, B, C, that corresponds to different exposures. And between each exposure, you move the telescope slightly. So that they all overlap, but not completely. But if a source, say here is a source, a star, then it was first sitting in, 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 in point in A, it was sitting in the upper right corner, and then in point in C, it's sitting in the lower left corner. And then you can combine the images, and that helps you also uh, to flat field the array. But you could also get an image of the background uh, sky in, in uh, the way you compute the medium. Do you know what the medium is? Do you know what the average is? Yes. Good. Okay. So, say, average, you... Can you turn on the light, please? Yes. Right? So let's say you make a measurement and the numbers are I'm running out of space here, but okay. Uh, let's say you measure one, two, 
moved it. Oops. Okay. In the next image here, that star isn't here anymore. And so we could just for we could just look at the values of a, an individual pixel. Of course, we have to do this for all the pixels. But if we just look at the value of an individual pixel and we compute the median, then it will be filtered out. There will be no image of the star in the median image here. Now, if we would just take the average. That would mean star plus four times no star, then you have a quarter of a star here. Right? But if you take the median, if you essentially sort the values that you read of the detector here, and you take the median, then you are not affected by this detection here. And that's a very powerful way to filter out sources in order to get a sky background image. And with that, now you can subtract it from your image. You wouldn't have to take any extra measurements of the sky. You get this for free in your observations. You just dither, and your galaxy moves, relatively speaking, in your image. And then you calculate the median. And since the galaxy is not always at the same pixel, the median filters out the image. And you only have an image of the background emission of the atmosphere. That's unique background. The atmosphere is everywhere, so it will not be filtered out with the media. Only point sources or small sources. Okay, and then you can subtract it. And then you're left. Now we have to, we know how to flat field the detector. We know how to subtract the sky image. And then we have a beautiful galaxy. Because it heats up, 
the resistance, the electrical resistance will change. If the resistance changes, then we see a change in the voltage across that pixel. Yeah, and, and that is the information that we get. The advantage is that there is for the thermal energy, there is no distinct minimum energy. So no cutoff wavelengths in that sense. And therefore, these are the preferred detectors for the, for the longer wavelengths, the far infrared and the symphony wavelengths. And of course, this is a single pixel. This is just to say that, of course, in modern detectors, you do this uh, more, more efficiently in large structures. Large structures is quite true because these are still only, only fractures of millimeters, but you can etch that, uh, these, these structures in, in, for example, in silicon, and then it's hard to produce uh, uh, larger arrays, but you can already see that these look very different from, from CCDs. And these are some real detectors. This one is the detect bolometers. This one is a bolometer that was used in Herschel, the Herschel satellite, the PAX uh, bolometer. 64 by 32 pixels. I mean, you can also see that because the structure is more complex, you cannot easily put there many in, in two dimensions. So usually, uh, they have fewer pixels in the head, oops, in the in the, uh, in the sub millimeter range. Here is another example for an instrument called La Boca. It is a, a bolometer array for the Apex telescope. Apex is the, the Atacama Pathfinder Experiment Telescope, which is co-operated by the Max Planck Institute in ESO. So this is, a, this is a, essentially a single ALMA antenna that was used uh, to show that the ALMA concept works on this altitude. It's working at 870 micrometers. So this is, this is uh, uh, obviously at a uh, far as uh, it's a millimeter wavelength. And in order to make this work, again, we're looking at tiny temperature changes in the pixel. In order to make this work, this whole thing is cooled to 280 millikelvin. So less than one degree above absolute zero. So you can imagine that operating these detectors is not trivial. Because you need a really sophisticated cooling technique and apparatus. It's also not easy to carry it around. There will, I can predict there will be no smartphones that detect some millimeter radiation uh, because you wouldn't be able to, to carry the cooling equipment. And it has about 295 pixels actually. I mean, you can personally you can start counting the pixels. Uh, but because the pixels are complicated, they usually not, they don't have 100% filling factor. Meaning that there is a pixel, and between that pixel and the next pixel, there's a gap. But, okay, now we know first from our sampling uh, discussion that uh, if you don't have a very good spatial sampling, you're undersampled and you're missing information. And because you're undersampled, the way that the people do that then is they constantly move the detector around, actually, really constantly, literally speaking, and, and then sort of mathematically reconstruct the missing pieces of your of in, in your image plan. Okay. And uh, just just at the very end, when I said about cooling things, uh, this is a typical sometimes in, in many astronomical labs, or at least it used to be a standard by, by provided by the infrared labs in Arizona, a a QR bright stand. Just to show you how something like that works, there are also uh, different coolers nowadays, but if you just have liquid nitrogen and liquid helium, what you can do is you have an outer, an outer case, metal usually made of aluminum, and then you have an inner tank here with a radiation shield around that you fill with liquid nitrogen just to absorb the radiation from the 300 Kelvin outer shell. And then in that, so that absorbs most of the heat load, in that you have another tank here that you fill with liquid helium. So that one gets you down to something like 77 Kelvin. That one will get you to 4 Kelvin. And then at the bottom of this tank that is at 4 Kelvin, then you, you mount your optics. And then 
So liquid helium typically gets you to 4 Kelvin. If you want it colder, you can actually put in a pump there, just pump on it. So you mean that you lower the pressure here, and because then it's, it's like the thing is sweating, right? So then it, 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 it will become colder. And then uh, you get to 2 Kelvin. If you want smaller temperatures, like remember our Laboka detector was at 280 millikelvin. So if you want to get there, you need some, some very sophisticated refrigerators. And, and that's you know, So there are usually uh, different methods to cool, but cooling is very important for those detectors, and that's also contributing to the size. Right? Now you know why we would like to have fast optics. Because your optical system has to fit in here. And if your optical system becomes big, your cryostat or your tumor becomes even bigger. And, and you all have to cool and align and that's And yeah, that's it for today. Any questions? Any more questions? Yes?